Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Next on Closer to Truth. When people hear that we discover planets by the gravitational effect that planet has on its host star, they say, you mean you don't actually see the planet? And I say, no. Gravity is as much a signature of something's existence as a direct photograph. If you live in a cabin in the woods, you come to learn what a bare footprint looks like very quickly. And if you see such a footprint outside one morning, you'll start looking for the bear that was once there. confidently predict what's going on. What about all the catastrophes, the giant explosions of severe radiation in the universe, uh, uh, comets and, and asteroids, you know, I mean, it's, flying it, all around it, all the time? It's bad. There. That, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a hostile environment. But before we wax poetic about how bad it is, consider that the last major extinction, the one that took out the dinosaurs, enabled the tree shrew to evolved to something more ambitious than a rodent uh, or some other small mammal to, to become what we are today. So th these impacts are takers away as well as givers of mm -hmm. the diversity of well, life Well, some are Earth. not. Some are radiation that I think would be destructive. Uh, some stars die benignly like our own sun. Uh, so another five billion not, not years. Not benign to us. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, it goes to show how much of an astronomer I'm very <laughs> The sun will just expand very yeah, gently. So you know, it okay, will be so a cinder orbiting deep within the sun's yeah, surface yeah. as it expands yeah. through its so, red But it's about five billion years from now, so we shouldn't be too worried. But the other stars, the more massive stars, and they do die catastrophically, and they can die supernovae, which is very common. At some point, it runs out of fuel, and then it starts collapsing, because gravity is the ultimate winner in all this game. So it starts collapsing, and the collapse process itself releases what we call as gravitational binding energy, some of which now comes off in, in a flash and in, in gas coming out of it at very high speeds. And these supernovae are not uncommon. There's one supernovae in our own galaxy every 100 years. Um, so if you're close to one, uh, that could be pretty bad. So what do you call close? Certainly, a 1,000 light years in this definition would be close by anyone's theory of what a supernova would do. And then there are even more exotic, catastrophic things, which is this gamma ray bursts. And gamma ray bursts uh, are... Um, they're rare, but they have, their sphere of influence is, is, is tremendous. Is that like the most powerful explosive energy in the universe? Yes, uh, it's the most powerful now? directed explosive energy. So it, it, they, they come out as basically beams of light and radiation. And we don't understand all this very well, but we are talking of thousands, many, many thousands of light years as definitely being their sphere of uh, of you know death. Why is now such an exciting time in the search for life elsewhere in the universe? There's been something happening on the Earth, which has been the discovery in mid-ocean ridges, in groundwater very deep, of living systems, organisms, microorganisms, that survive in environments we've never believed possible. Incredibly, they chemically process things. They don't need photosynthesis, don't need sunlight to do it. And so I think, for me personally, that is as much a reason to become optimistic, or at least less pessimistic, <laughs> about finding life on Mars or finding it in another planet around another star than almost every, everything else. Well, I would ask, why didn't we know about this? It's just on the bottom of the ocean. Where we, why, why not 50 years ago? Just on the bottom of the ocean. These are <laughs> hard to recover. Okay. I think there's two reasons. Going back to my own geological training, um, it, was, it wasn't in the picture. You didn't think about it. I, I think, Bruce, what you left out in that whole discussion is the life at the bottom of that ocean does not require sunlight right. as a direct source of its energy. And once you remove the sun as a requirement, it allows you to think of other 
ways you might have energy to sustain life. When you teach uh, introductory astronomy, you talk about uh, this habitable zone around a star, and let's take describe what that uh, is. Yeah, uh, let's take the sun for example. Life as we know it requires liquid water, all right, in the naive sense of this notion. And so, if there's a planet a little too close to the host star, the water would evaporate. Miles away. A little too far away, it's frozen. And so, there's this sort of Goldilocks <laughs> interval where you have liquid water. And for quite a long time, that concept dominated our thinking and our discussions about how and where we might look for life around in another star system. What are some of those conditions? It, you need energy. That's the ultimate part you need to get life going. It can be tidal, it can be solar, and so on. How about extreme cold? Th that's interesting because the satellite of Jupiter called Europa has an icy crust. We know that. And probably not terribly thin. There's probably salt water below that. So maybe that's kind of like the Arctic Ocean or the Antarctic. And there are studies that have been done that have detected organisms that really do seem to be able to live in the ice. If you stick a thermometer, it's minus 20 degrees centigrade. It's below freezing, way below. And the organisms not only can survive, but they can apparently live. But the fluid within them is still liquid. Right. So yeah. they're not in a frozen yeah, state. Yeah, they're not somehow. little solid things. Solid. Like, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. It's tougher than that because it's hard to find out something's alive. And the usual test is it's got to reproduce. And so unless you can cause it to reproduce and measure metabolism, it's very difficult to say something's alive. So in, in extreme environments, we're not used to how do you culture those things? It's not that simple. How do you know it wasn't some contaminant from the bucket to pick the stuff off the ground? How do you know it wasn't in your lab? How do you know it didn't come out of the air? So now, because of these extremophiles, when we think about life elsewhere in the galaxy, yeah. we no longer restrict ourselves to this Goldilocks zone because of these, uh, the, how, how, how much broader our thinking has become. Why is now such an exciting time in the search for life elsewhere in the universe? There are actually two reasons. One is that there's a lot of technology now that for the first time in our entire history, we can address meaningfully the question of planets elsewhere and perhaps even say something about the existence of large-scale life, by which I mean organisms or trees and so on. But the other one is uh, probably just as important, a bit more subtle, and that astronomers can now more or less say with a lot of confidence that every time a star is formed, a born, then planet formation is a necessary byproduct. So I think this is pretty much the start of a golden era in this field. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree, so especially in the last 10 years, ever since the first discovery, the first announced discovery of a planet around a star other than the sun. And I remember distinctly the day that that planet count exceeded the number of planets around our own sun. So we have people who are now um, children, for example, who have only known a time where we have in our log books more planets outside of our solar system than within. They ask somebody who's 30 or older, how many planets are, and they all say nine. They say, no, I'm sorry, it's about 59 <laughs> as far as we know right now. <laughs> sorry, 80, it's 80. It's 80. 80. Wow, oh, yeah. wow. It's, it's, uh, we'll hit 100 now, any minute now. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we know they're there? Well, there are basically three techniques and in various stages of uh, sophistication at the current time. The, the simplest one is where the starlight itself is telling you some information. Well, here's, let's say, a star, and then um, I, uh, let's say, I'll use a penny as my planet, as the planet's going around. So as the planet goes around, the star is gently uh, tugged, and either you can by see the this gravitational by field attraction of the, of, yeah, of, of the planet, planet, which may be small, but it's nonetheless measurable. So what you would end up seeing is uh, the star undergoes this sort of a motion. And astronomers detect this in two different ways. One is something called radial velocity, which is just how, the, you know, the, the motion with respect to you, let's say. Uh, and that's, that's the current uh, technique, which is uh, producing this uh, abundance of planets that Neil... Uh, how big is that radial velocity? Oh, uh -huh. we are talking of meters per second, you know, tens of meters per and, second. And you can detect meters uh, per second differences yes. at uh, That's part uh, of the years. technologically enabling Amazing. factors of the past 10 yeah, years and, of and the way to, telescope and, and the way to design. look at this is uh, 
even a few meters per second is only one part in 10 to the 8. That is one part in 100 million. Right, that's of the a speed. big number. Yeah, that's a big number. One so, part in 100, 100 million, million. So you're you, detecting. You gotta, yeah, you got to see small variations which are delicate for one part in 100 million. Uh, and astronomers can do that quite reliably. It took a while, but we are there now. But I would add that these, these Jupiter-sized planets that we see around, okay, can I make a star here? <laughs> <laughs> a double star. Yeah, a double star system. <laughs> um, the kind of planet you will discover first is the large, the large planet and one that is close to the host star, mm -hmm. which would then execute one period rather quickly, and you can get that signature uh -huh. in your data. Right, right. And so all of the first waves of data discovered large planets close, close to, to the, the host, host star. star. We need a much longer baseline of time, even to find a bigger planet far away. Because Earth would take a year. It would take a year. Jupiter, our Jupiter in our solar system, right. takes 10, 12 years to go around. And so we've only been taking data for 12 years. Right. So right. we would not have even seen right. a full orbit of yeah. Jupiter by yeah. now. Uh, you know, I'm often asked when people hear that we discover planets by the gravitational effect that planet has on its host star, they say, you mean you don't actually see the planet? And I say, no, we measure the gravity. And people get worried, well, if you can't see it, how do you know it's there? And I simply say that gravity is as much a signature of something's existence as a direct photograph of it. We have many ways we can measure something is there. Just as you do, if you live in a cabin in the woods, you come to learn what a bare footprint looks like very quickly. And if you see such a footprint outside one morning, you'll start looking for the bear that was once there. Uh, you're not gonna say, oh, I didn't see the bear, therefore it couldn't have existed. So uh, it's that kind of inferences we make that have been very powerful throughout the history of astronomy. It's how we first even expected there to be the planet Neptune from its gravitational effect on the planet Uranus. Uh, no one knew what was causing that. We said, the gravity tells us there's an object out there. The other technique that's been in development for some time now, and it's also coming of age with uh, ground-based uh, facilities uh, at, at Keck uh, in Hawaii. This is called interferometry. That is, when you it, have two. When, when you have more than one telescope and you had to combine the light, and by combining the light, you get more synergism, basically, and the technical word for that is interferometry. It's so, as if the telescope was much bigger than bigger either than, one of absolutely. those. Absolutely. With that technique, as well as the next mission that NASA has already funded called the Space Interferometry Mission, uh, astronomers will be able to go after uh, more distant Jupiters, as well as get, for the first time, around normal stars, we'd be able to look at... Um, Can I have my glasses? Yes. <laughs> uh, and so let's imagine this quarter is a star. And of course, this is back my penny, it's a, it's a planet. <laughs> so um, as a, so here's a star, and you're seeing the star you, both ways. Mm -hmm. And as this uh, planet uh, 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 is going around the star and is at some point, it comes and occults it. So from that occulting meaning it it's, crosses, it's, yeah, crosses eclipses its face. it. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if there's no planet, if the planet is not eclipsing it, you get all the light from the star. But when it is in front of it, then you you get a little less light. Feel. And some of the planets have been detected with that occulting. Yes, one technique. planet has been detected first, identified through this radial velocity technique, and then followed up. Uh, Let's talk uh, about Europa and Mars because well, that's close and that's yeah, real. And that's you right. guys, uh, it's in our backyard. If we have evidence for life, ever, whether or not it's there now, but dig down the surface of Mars. Mars we know had running water. Uh, their dried riverbeds that meandered, floodplains, river deltas, all this tantalizing evidence that it was once an oasis. And wherever we know oasis, an oasis is on Earth, it's got life. So if life ever existed on Mars, that's our backyard right there. Yeah, right. And there's a problem. What's the problem? And that astronomers don't appreciate, nor biologists, I might imagine, when they when talk about it. The surface of Mars is self-sterilizing. The ultraviolet radiation reaches the surface. Today, it's right. self-sterilizing. It's what? really self-sterilizing. Today. Down for maybe a meter, who knows, 10 meters, we don't. Today. Cells, there's no organic material on it. Today. Today, you're right. So that means that whatever life did form. Might have formed. Right, <laughs> did or might, <laughs> depending on which side of NASA you're on. Right. Uh, the, but, but that means that it had to either evolve or be subterranean life, like in the groundwater of the Earth. 
question. Because it can So you go digging and you find it. And if you find it, okay. it means but, one of our nearest planets but, has life. You're, you're, That's you're good. glossing over the problem. How far we have to dig? I'm, I'm trying to say it's a much more difficult task. It could, in the extreme case, require the equivalent of a human expedition with great big drills. I'm and, not worried about how okay, big our shovel is when we get there. If oh, it's got, got it. life, so, then it's got life. Well, okay, so I, I think that's important. Europa is a different kind of problem because Europa is not just self-sterilizing. It's in the field of, of Jupiter's radiation belts. It's lethal for anything that we want to send, including many robots. So you have to build the uh, same kind of technology used in a nuclear weapon or that you use... Hardened electronics. Uh, hardened yeah. electronics and so forth. So again, it's not easy. The extremophile thing we're looking for lives in an area that not just humans can't take but even robots can't so it's again it's a challenge we'll do it I agree it, we've got to do it and both of those are good targets yeah, of yeah. course let me come back to my earth-centered solar-centered view but I think it's quite relevant which is the a overriding question about us a philosophical and it's a really a religious question is are we something special here in this solar system, and therefore our Earth's kind of special, and therefore the fact that we're sitting here talking is special? Or is that really very common throughout this, the, the galaxy? That, that's probably a, about as important a question as I know how to formulate scientifically that, that, that could be answered with science. Or are we the freak? Because my hunch, personally, watching this happen, is when you find Jupiter at the distance of Mercury, which is what these some of these places have. Very close in. Yeah. Right. If that's the typical thing, and we here are unusual, that's got tremendous implications about the abundance of life, and especially the abundance of human, or, or at least intelligent life, I think. Bruce, I, I, you maybe That's my... Yeah, okay. I, 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 I think we're going to take up on you on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Are you ready? Uh, okay, <laughs> you go ahead. No, 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 that life is not only hardy, given how many environments we find it on Earth, it's also uh, easier than we know to form. First, even if Earth at our distance from the sun is rare, you know, you bring your nearby Jupiter to the sun, and that Jupiter might have 40 moons or 50 moons, some of which would then possibly harbor life. So that doesn't scare me that perhaps Earth at the Goldilocks distance is somehow rare. But there are two points that need to be reckoned with. Typically when people ask how soon did life appear on Earth, they take the age of the Earth and subtract the age of the oldest fossil. And if you do that, you get 4.6 billion minus 3.8 billion, and you get 800 million years. And you say, well, that's pretty quick, but it's better than that because Earth spent about 600 million years in a period of heavy bombardment, vacuuming up the remains of the solar system. And the Earth's surface was basically sterilized because of the deposited energy and the heat. It was basically molten for 600 million years. It's not fair to start your stopwatch at mm -hmm. the beginning of that because complex molecules can't survive it. Wait till we cool down, then start your stopwatch, 200 million years. That's nothing in a cosmic time scale. It seems to me if life were something hard, it would have taken Earth a little longer than 200 million years, maybe several billion years. And one final point, if you look at the ingredients of life, you learn in your biology class it's water. water. You break apart water, you have hydrogen and oxygen. So you have hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen. That's what we're made of. The chemistry of these ingredients is the chemistry of life. And you look in the universe, there they are in the universe. Hydrogen, it's got, also got helium, but that's inert. So uh, oxygen, carbon, in the same order. If we were made of some isotope of plutonium, you could argue <laughs> that we were rare. So I, I'm, I have high confidence in this. And I, it's not I just dream, I'm not just being <laughs> dreaming here. It seems to me planet formation just empirically is very common and we just know our planetary system well and we know nothing about the remaining 90-95% which is why these, you need these missions, these other techniques. How many years light. do you think it will take to get a sufficient amount of information as we're doing it now to be able to make an informed uh, opinion about the uh, some generalities about what we can know in the immediate future. I think it's just money at this point. It's not like we're not smart enough to know what the questions are at this point. By the way, the questions we're asking, just as a caveat here, uh, a lot of the answers we'll be finding may be as a result because we're, 
we're looking for our car keys under the lamppost uh, where, it's, where the light is illuminating it. Uh, there may be systems that, in fact, are unlike Earth that are just perfectly happy making life that we have yet to think of. And science is full of examples of, uh, like this. But it's just a matter of funding, funding the, the, the Kepler mission the so, space interferometry yeah, so, mission. So I put it 10, 20 years yeah. before we... I would say the, the main, the, the, the one that will really fill this gap between the radial velocity techniques and the occultation, which have similar sort of biases or similar sort of systems they'll find, is really the space interferometer mission and interferometry in general. So I would say by about 2015, because SIM will get launched in 2009, we'll, we'll have a fairly good idea of, of uh, an inventory of uh, planetary systems. You're looking for oxygen, you know, in, yeah, in the so, atmosphere? So the, the next step really is how to do more detailed analysis. Occultation, as I said, is a relatively inexpensive here and now technique, but it requires very favorable orientation. So if you find evidence of planets, let's say, around Alpha Centauri, then you really want to, you, you, you can't expect it to be all nicely lined up for you. We don't know how to make this mission. We don't know whether it should be in the infrared or optical, and this is something that astronomers are more actually thinking right now. Aren't they talking about putting telescopes at opposite ends of the solar system? No, so telescopes people will be. dream that. <laughs> we, we got to right. yeah. <laughs> work our way. They will be like you know tens of meters to perhaps uh, hundreds of meters, depending on exactly what they end up, uh, what whether which wavelength will operate. And this 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 sort of a mission, which is called Terrestrial Planet Finder (TPF). It's being talked about. Uh, it'll be expensive, uh, and and but I, again, my own guess is this will happen about roughly about 2015. Let me give you an, a different point of view. We are in a very early process of discovery and exploration, and it sounds very organized. It sounds like laboratory science. It's not. You look and you find, and the trick is to look properly and broadly. Uh, we could find something next year where one of these occultations or another technique shows evidence of carbon dioxide gas, which is strongly apparent in our atmosphere, and also methane gas, which is strongly apparent in Jupiter's atmosphere. What would be significant is those two are incompatible. One is an oxidized gas, carbon dioxide. One is a reduced gas, methane. And they're made of very common stuff. Now, if we got lucky, and if that happens, they're over powering conclusion is it's got to be a disequilibrium going on, namely life, because that's why we have that on the Earth. We have exactly that situation. Cow flatulence <laughs> giving us methane and, in the and atmosphere. Plants, <laughs> and plants giving us carbon dioxide. So we could get you know, surprised or something comparable to this, or this powerful techniques we've described might not show that. We, hmm. And it's going to be very hard to prove life or even have a high suspicion unless we get lucky with something like that. I'd rather say I think it's likely between now and in 30 years it will happen. Sort of a cumulative probability. That's still within the lifetime of hopefully all of us, but That's certainly yes. most of the people. Of most people alive right. today. Right. Yes. Yeah. Right. I, I will be disappointed personally if we don't have a strong indication that there's life. And if we don't have one, my conclusion would be maybe it isn't there. Maybe, in fact, well, there's I, something special about this solar system. That would be in violation of the Copernican principle, suggesting that we're n nothing we've ever measured about our circumstances has ever been special. Either answer to the question is, is overwhelming. Right, exactly. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> A new term has uh, developed, uh, astrobiology. Is this, uh, are you comfortable with that term? Oh, yeah. You know, astronomers can't do it alone. You know, there's certain questions we know how to ask that don't include the kinds of questions a biologist would ask mm -hmm. if you brought them along on a mission. Same is true if you bring along a geologist. Uh, better yet, a, a, a paleontologist. If mm -hmm. there's uh, some history of life buried within the soils, you need somebody who has experience rummaging through uh, cross sections of, uh, uh, of a planet. So there's been a, a realignment of effort by multiple disciplines all asking the same question. Uh, the chemists, the biologists, the astronomers, uh, we all want to know about life elsewhere in the cosmos. And astrobiology is a nice umbrella term for that, uh, although keep in mind that it's an entire field with no data. Right now, <laughs> there, we have not one example of life off of Earth, so um, they're, they're anxiously awaiting their first sample <laughs> for the lab. 
Well, I, I won't say it's no data in the sense, I think all this life in extreme environments is, uh, I think... Uh, that's not astro, that's geobiology. Uh, okay, I, which I is wasn't... A distinguished, wonderful field. <laughs> it's starter data. Yeah, it's, it's starter uh, that's fair. Data. Yeah, that's yeah. fair. Uh -huh. So, I mean, what's Practice really... Practice data. Practice data. <laughs> what's really missing here, actually, is while many fields actually have a theoretical basis, astronomy has a theoretical basis, certainly physics, which is the granddaddy of all, has a very sound theoretical basis. And it took a long time for the chemists to get a theoretical basis with their bonds. The problem is that biology has no, th there is no such thing, at least to my knowledge, of a theory of biology. Uh, it seemed very complicated. What you're almost saying is that you can't make a, the uh, a, a theoretical biology unless you have more than one data point. Unless you have more than one data well, point. It's historically always been the case, right? I mean, chemistry wasn't understood as a said. discipline mm -hmm. until you could see patterns and so on. You've got to see patterns. You've got to classify data. You, you need to, to do all that butterfly collecting first. And unfortunately, that's why I said, so this is a little difficult subject because you can't do this collection in the field because the field is a bit far away. It's yeah. exciting because this is a, a unifying human quest. Yep. And all peoples, all societies, all groups have the same all meaning time. to it. Yeah. For all time. For all time. time. For yeah. all time. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. And call it a quest, not a field. Because it's not a field yet. You can't have a field without a single example of, of life elsewhere. So it's a quest. It is a noble. It's As alchemy was a quest. I mean, there's right. people rag on alchemy. Pan out. No, but people rag on alchemy. <laughs> but wait, 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 wait. People rag on alchemy, but consider that at least it was a, an experimental subject, and it happened in laboratories, and there were important foundations from alchemy that led to chemistry. And so you had to begin somewhere. Alchemy had no, no. Uh, 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 theoretical foundation that was working for them. But so, it had a wonderfully compelling idea. I would take lead into gold. <laughs> yeah, it had a quest. Right. That, right. yeah. It was an interesting one. Uh, uh, yeah.